Maryland Medical System. I'm pleased to have each of you join us this afternoon for our second in a series on mental health and wellness issues related to COVID-19. Today's topic is about our children and helping children cope during this pandemic. For many of us as adults, we may have trouble coping with the uncertainty, social distancing, longevity of isolation, and concern for our own health or for that of our loved ones and our friends. Imagine then what the impact may be on children who may be confused about the science of COVID-19, whose schedules may be completely disrupted, they're out of school, they may not see their family and friends in the ways that they are accustomed, and they may not know how to handle their emotions, how to articulate their thoughts, or where or how to get their questions and concerns addressed. Children experience anxiety and concern, just like adults, although it may show up differently, and it's our responsibility to help them feel comfortable and confident in their environment and in their everyday lives. As parents and trusted adults, how we comport ourselves and interact with children who depend upon us can greatly impact how they feel. Here to talk to us today about helping children cope in the COVID-19 era is Kay Connors. Kay is an instructor at the University of Maryland School of Medicine, and she's a licensed clinical social worker who specializes in child and family traumatic stress and mental health. And she works on a number of projects focused on improving access to high quality infant, child, adolescent, and young adult mental health services. She's the director of the Taki Magadashi Center for Infant Study and the director of the Center for Excellence for Infant and Early Childhood Mental Health. She's an adverse childhood experiences master trainer and an affiliate of the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. At the end of Ms. Connor's presentation, we'll share a few resources with you that may be of value to you. And we'll also be able to take several of your questions. If you have a question, just please feel free at any time to type it in the Q&A box, and we'll try to take up all that we can. Before we begin, let me say, this presentation will provide general wellness information and tips it is not intended as a substitute for medical or behavioral health advice. Please contact your healthcare provider for specific guidance or recommendations should you need to. And we will again share resources that are available to you, many of which you can find at our dedicated website, which is ums.org slash coronavirus. Okay. Thank you, Donna. I'm really glad to be with you all today in this extraordinary time in this new way um, what we're what we hope to do is think together and reflect on what we know works for families who are um, trying to cope and help their kids um, be safe and stay on track developmentally before we get started i want to also give a special thanks to my superhero colleagues at the University of Maryland Medical Systems who display skills and compassion and commitment to helping us all stay healthy and safe. Next slide, please. So one of the, the words of wisdom, and you'll see this in kind of all types of uh, resources and media um, statements, is, is something really true. Um, and it's really helping us think about whether or not we're wearing our own life jackets. Um, I know many of us that grew up around the Chesapeake Bay and sometimes we would get cavalier about, we don't really need that life jacket on the sailboat or the, or the rowboat, but this is really a time to, to think about safety. So your health and, and well-being is essential to your children's health and well-being. Um, be kind to yourself, take that moment to put your life jacket on, establish routines and ways of working that set you up for success. Um, they might not necessarily be the way you did things before, uh, so it's perfectly reasonable to move on and, and develop things that are working for the here and now, this, this new moment. Reach out for help. Many of us are helpers and people that are not used to reaching out for help. Um, but that's what resources are there for, and we hope that um, 
you can continue to use the resources that we're compiling to help you be informed, but to also help you with um, services if needed and, and basic resources. So of course, wear your mask, stay home, and uh, stay six feet apart if you have to leave home. Next slide, please. So I wanna just take a moment to center ourselves as we think about where we are about six weeks so or into this, um, into this uh, outbreak. So in the beginning, if you think about the fear zone, for those of you that can look at the slide, um, we're thinking about who do we want to be during this time, during this time. And of course, at the very beginning, rightly so, we were focused on survival. Getting food and toilet paper, medicines, um, really a rapid response to trying to stabilize and prepare for this time of, of stay at home. Uh, it's a time where, understandably, fears are very high and the messages that we might be receiving might be triggering and frightening and our emotions can run uh, very hot during those times. But as we move out of that mid part of the brain, that part of the brain that really helps us with survival, we, we engage the front part of our brain. And that's the, where our learning center is. It helps us identify emotions, integrate our emotions into our thinking so that we are better prepared to make safe and healthy decisions. Uh, we're better able to evaluate information we're receiving and recognizing uh, what is working best for our unique situation and, and our families. Uh, we also have to think through what we have control over and what we don't have control over and accept that and, and commit to, to staying healthy and on track during this difficult time. Now we're, we should be moving into the growth zone, the time where we really know that we are stronger together and what are we going to do and what can we contribute to uh, making, helping our families heal, getting ready for recovery post the, the outbreak, but also helping our friends and neighbors and colleagues. Uh, I am so moved by the incredible creativity um, that I see in my own neighborhood, on TV shows, the stories I hear um, from my clinical colleagues about the things that, the solutions that families have not only come up for, for, for themselves, but the empathy that they show for neighbors and, um, and the community as a whole. And I think this is really what helps us all hold on to hope and helps us um, be able to get through um, the, the difficult timeline that, that we're in. Next slide, please. So the most important part of thinking about um, helping kids cope through this, cope with this difficult time is addressing safety first. So we can't be, we can't be healthy and we can't be well if we have concerns about safety. And this, uh, this uh, epidemic has really um, put many families in situations that they've never been in before. Um, concerns about food, how to access it, how to, how to get it in a safe way, um, worries about running out of food, um, also concerns about living in housing situations where um, there really isn't enough space to get work done and schooling done and, and things like that. So there are very significant safety issues that are important to consider. Reaching out to Maryland 211 is a good place to start, but also uh, working with your medical providers. We are all learning to uh, wear many different hats and we're also learning how to reach out to others to, to help you and, and families that we serve. Next slide, please. One of the things that is near and dear to the work that we do in, um, in the field of mental health is not only thinking about basic physical safety, but the importance of emotional safety. 
And we know from, from families and um, patients that we have served over time that focusing on emotional safety is just as vital to health and well being. So, children really count on um, adults and parents and other wise people in their family to help them name and identify feelings and help them. Um, and it also helps with decreasing some of the conflict or potential violence or for patients that have mental health concerns, any thoughts of, of hurting themselves. If you have concerns about any of these areas um, in your family um, and, and you're worried about the mental health of a family member, um, there are hotlines that we'll walk through at the end and there are expert um, trained folks to talk to you on the hotline and to help you connect to various resources. And if it really is a, a emergency that you're concerned about, 911 is still operating and um, helping families that have safety concerns. So don't hesitate. Next slide, please. So thinking about coping, what do kids need? Um, if you're able to see this lovely picture of, the fa of a family um, playing on the beach, you can see by the way that parents are positioned that they're standing behind their kids, that those kids are happy, they feel loved and protected, and they know that they have folks behind them, helping them do this hard job of, um, of, of, play, of, of pulling the rope. Kids need to understand what's happening and they need to understand it at their own developmental level. So for our, our teenagers, their bodies and brains are built to, to strive to be with other people their own age. That's really their developmental task, uh, to learn to, to be with peers, to make friends, to learn how to work in projects with other people. This is an, a specifically difficult time for them. So they really need a chance to talk that through. They might need new rules around technology so that they not only use it for studying, but they also are using it um, to, con to stay connected with friends. Um, the burden of isolation uh, on them is, is, is pretty high. Young kids really need their parents to understand what all the what all the fright is about. They need parents to be specific, to talk about germs. They need parents to talk about why they're staying inside and why they can only talk to their neighbor by staying um, on this side of the fence and not going um, over to their house. They need it explained that it's not that people don't like them anymore, but it's that they're, they're, uh, everybody's working hard to not spread germs and to stay safe. So thinking about where your kids are at different ages and being able to speak to what their developmental um, concerns might be. We also have some resources to, to share about that as well. Um, all of us really, feelings are meant to be shared. So all of us uh, need a loved, compassionate other person to help us think through and talk about our feelings so that we can uh, get settled with them and better understand them and respond in uh, more with our, the thinking part of our brain. Uh, and all kids, even little toddlers, need to feel capable and helpful and that they can do something to make things better. Um, my daughter is home from college and she's learning how to cook so that when she moves into her college um, dorm and house next year, she'll have a new set of skills and it's also helping us as well. Little ones might learn to fold laundry. Maybe mom and dad were always so busy that they always took care of those chores, but maybe now's the time um, to teach those little ones, not just to be helpful, but also because it makes them feel capable and, and competent. Next slide, please. So talking with your children and explaining why things are different are very important. Um, we, you can see uh, a, a fun uh, cartoon that our team uh, developed that helps kids talk about the things that they can do to be helpers, washing their hands, 
um, sneezing and coughing into tissues, um, avoiding touching their face and, and wearing masks as well. Um, we don't want to scare particularly young children, so we want to give them information that they can understand and use. We also want to point out to children that there are so many people out there helping. And I think that there have been incredible news stories about frontline workers at um, grocery stores, um, at our first responders, and our incredible uh, nurses and doctors and colleagues that are working in the medical centers. Uh, so taking time to point out the helpers and what each of us can do to be a helper really and it is true that everyone has something has a role to play in helping to keep each other safe and to to move through this um, pandemic safely next slide please so another just another way to think about um, the power of, of feelings and talking about feelings is a term that Daniel Siegel uses, and he says, name it to tame it. Uh, Fred Rogers also used, talked about it as, if it's mentionable, it's manageable. So all that to say, we don't need to be perfect. We can fumble around with the words. It's really the effort that we put in. Uh, it's just about being good enough and understanding, as Donna had mentioned, that children, including very young children, have the same fears that we have as grownups. We fear, um, we fear getting sick. We fear losing people that we love. We fear being separated from people that are near and dear to us. And uh, we fear not being able to make a difference or not being able to grow and, and, and learn. So giving yourselves and your kids those opportunities can really um, help to tame the fears and worries that, that naturally arise uh, during this difficult time. Uh, it might seem simple to say talking and listening makes a difference, but in truth, that's what is really powerful. Next slide, please. <laughs> So parents, you're holding so much, you have the most difficult job. You might be worried about financing, finances, you're trying to work from home, or you're an essential employee that has to go out into the community and you're um, worried about um, exposure to, to yourself and to your families. Uh, these are times where it's really important to take that moment for yourself, whether it's a corner of the room or the steps on the back in the backyard, or just a place you can carve out in your own mind to take a moment to think, think about yourself and how you're doing and to do a check-in. Once you're able to check in with yourself, then you're better able to see the signs of stress in your children. And they look, they might look different, they might look the same. Um, young kids um, are going to probably have more temper tantrums, uh, though they also might enjoy some of this time. They, they like your attention. Um, they like having time with you. Um, but that might be very challenging if you're trying to get chores in the house done or work that you're trying to do from home. So talking with them about how much they need and deserve your attention but there's setting aside times where that's gonna be more realistic. Um, teenagers are probably gonna have more signs of stress about uh, their social situations, worrying about their friends, wondering about what's going on, feeling disconnected and, and possibly even unliked by, by their other friends. So they're gonna need some support and some time to think through um, their social uh, priorities and social anxieties. Routines can help everyone tame and manage the chaos of this time, but it might be that the routines that you used to have are, are not gonna be working right now. If you could focus on meals and sleep patterns to stabilize everyone's health, that would be great. 
if you could also think about how to share the technology in your household so that work and school can get done in a realistic way, um, that is going to help to tame some of the chaos and reduce some of the anxiety uh, during this time. So most likely you're going to have to create special, special routines for this time. Maybe you'll go back to the, the old ones or maybe you'll find new things that work. The Maryland State Department of Education has put together a toolkit for parents who are um, learning now to be uh, homeschoolers uh, and they have incredible resources that you can use to, to help with some of these tips that we're talking about today. Next slide, please. So lastly, I want to just put a plug in for, for fun. Uh, taking a moment uh, to, to take a break uh, from work for schoolwork or housework or your uh, work at home activities. Um, set those reasonable expectations around screen time and know that screen time is going to be expanded during this time. And that's probably something not to fight about, but instead get a good plan around. If there's some things that you can watch together and enjoy together, that could be um, a way to spend some, some fun family time. Um, doing things together outside, if that's a, a, an option for you or inside. Um, my daughter and I spent a week, it took us a long time to put together a thousand piece puzzle. Um, and we would listen to music while we did it. And it was just kind of a nice break uh, throughout the week to just take our mind off all the things that we needed to get done. And the uncertainty of the time that we're in. Next slide, please. So what we know from research is that all of us and including children have, are resilient. And children have what's called ordinary magic. Everybody is born with this capacity to be able to adapt and move forward. So in order to do that, some of the tips that we already talked about are important, but it's also important to remind yourself that this time won't last forever and that changes are happening every day, even though it might feel like time is standing still sometimes. But it's also a time to tap into memories of the past, particularly experiences and stories that illustrate how your child or your family or uh, stories from your heritage and your culture show the strength and ability of people to move through difficult times. There's also a wonderful resource um, through the Behavioral Health Administration called Mind Resilience, and it has wonderful videos as well as activities and uh, worksheets that, that anyone can do to build their resiliency during this time. Next slide. The school systems are doing a remarkable job uh, and also um, the rec centers to help with food distribution. So I encourage you to contact your local school or go to the, um, the State Department of Education's website to find out about um, meal plans for, um, for families and students. Next slide, please. The Children's Mental Health Matters has a very comprehensive uh, coronavirus um, page with all kinds of resources, uh, particularly ones that help you think about how to explain what's happening um, during this time to children of all ages. Next slide, please. And these are hotlines that um, you can use as well as support lines um, to talk with people with lived experience um, in dealing with mental health concerns um, to help you get connected to help if you're concerned about mental health uh, crises or needs. Next slide. I'm gonna pass it back to Donna for the next part of our presentation. Thank you so much, Kay. That was excellent. And you know, I really love that Supergirl 
cartoon. I think it's so illustrative and really helpful and very uplifting. There are a number of resources that are available to you through the University of Maryland Medical System. Kay mentioned a moment ago the meals that are provided through schools. All of our affiliate hospitals, and there are 13 in total at the University of Maryland Medical System, have been involved with providing meals to families, primarily on the weekends, at times that the schools are not um, doing so. So but, uh, many of the schools in your area will have that information as well. Information is on our, our various websites or um, social media from our, from our affiliate hospitals. In addition, available to you 24-7, is our nurse call line, which is dedicated to information related to COVID-19, uh, mostly in a general way. Many of the conversations are about symptoms that someone may be experiencing or trying to obtain tests. Um, and it is staffed by nurses full time. The number there, in case you're not looking at a screen and just are in with us on the line, is 1-888-713 zero seven one one and once again we have a dedicated website at ums which is ums.org slash coronavirus and there's quite a bit of information there related to uh, general information about coronavirus where to get resources symptoms to uh, think about be concerned about when to go to an emergency room how to make a mask and also information related to mental health next slide Today's uh, webinar is part of a three-part series. This is number two. The first one was last Thursday that aired, and it was general information about how to stay well in this period and how to maintain and protect your mental health. We have one coming up as well on Thursday, and I know some of you are already uh, registered for that. It's Thursday at 3, and you can reach it by the same link that you got in on today which is down at, you can look down at the bottom and that you can go there for the registration information. Thursday's webinar will be about mm -hmm. being isolated, which Kay touched upon a little bit, yet how to stay connected and how important that is to your mental health. Next slide. We're at the point now where we can take some, some of your questions that have come in, and I'm gonna start with a couple that I have seen already. One is, um, hey, what do I do if my child simply refuses to talk about coronavirus at all? That's a good question. And what I try to think about is what might be the meaning of, of that refusal? And maybe it's simply just recognizing and stating, uh, depending on the age of the child, that this might be too scary to think about and talk about. And maybe instead of more information, that child needs to know that, that the parents and the, and the people that are taking care of them uh, have a good plan to keep the child safe and the family safe. They might also be worrying about, particularly if their parent is an essential employee, about them leaving the house. And they might be having worries about, um, are their parents gonna be okay? And, and generally speaking, kids have, um, have kind of their radars out for that. Is my mom and dad gonna be okay? And if they're not okay, who's gonna take care of me? Sure, understandable. There's a question here that I'll answer actually, which is, are meals distributed only to public school students? I know that through the schools, they're generally trying to provide meals to students, but there are many resources, and as Kay mentioned, many wonderful uh, Good Samaritans around our community who are helping to provide so many meals in so many different contexts. The Maryland Food Bank is providing meals all across um, the Central Maryland area, Southern Maryland, uh, same thing. We have been providing meals to people who come forward. So while our first connection and thought was children who are out of school and who are so dependent upon those meals in school might not have an opportunity to eat as they need to, we've seen that many seniors have come to the locations where we've mm -hmm. been distributing and we're not turning people away. So that's um, 
that's there for you. But there are many people who are in the food distribution business these days, and that's really wonderful. Um, there's a question here. Would it be possible to post a parent toolkit in the link in the chat? I'm going to, once again, at the very end, give you the website where you can get information and the resources that we've spoken about will be there for you. Some are already up because of the webinar that was presented last week, and then some of the additional that you've just seen today or that Kay mentioned earlier will be up within about 48 hours. Let's see. Um, can I just ask my child if he's depressed? Did, is the question, can I ask my child if he's depressed? Yes, I, I'm not getting information. To, can I just ask him if he's depressed? Well, first, I'd want to know if he knows what the word depression, depressed means, right? So putting it in his words. Um, and I think what's important is to normalize it. I think all of us feel down and um, at different times of the day, at different days of the week during this uh, crisis. And so I think sharing that and normalizing that. So children often worry about is there something wrong with them and are they different than other people? Um, so I would first start it with kind of helping them understand what's normal. And then when it comes to depressed, depressed feelings, that there's some things that you could think about and look at. Um, keeping track of their sleeping and eating and have there been changes in and and for all of us there are changes around that but if they're really having trouble getting any kind of sleep in and or waking up that that feels kind of out of range for this time if their appetites have changed um beyond just wanting more comfort food like most of us want during this time um, but they're either not eating as much as they normally would or um, they're really having um problems with, with overeating, those would be things to talk about. Um, I th think there's, and some of the resources that we're putting up have really great tools about talking about feelings. And so I think sharing some of those tools, depending on the age of the child, could be a way to open that conversation. Um, a very simple thing to do is to just have a picture of feelings, either draw it yourself or or print something out from just, you know, an emoji list and get your child at some point in the day um, to circle the feelings they're having and then ask if you can check in again tomorrow. Because a lot of kids might not want to actually talk about it, but they might want to share their feelings in a different way. Great. Thank you. So you spoke about this a little bit. But a question has come in, are there warning signs of anxiety or depression or more that I should be on the lookout for? And would they be different in my six-year-old versus my 16-year-old? That's a great question. And I would say, yes, they are going to look different in your six-year-old and your 16-year-old. And one of the guiding lights is thinking about child development. So six-year-olds are probably in kindergarten or first grade, um, and they are very interested in learning the rules at school. Um, so giving them opportunities to play school, to hold in mind the things that they're missing, and to use play as an opportunity to share their feelings and thoughts and worries. Uh, for them, they're probably really missing their teacher. Uh, many little, you know, younger kids are kind of in love with their teacher. They're a substitute for you, the parents. And so they, they tend to, um, th this is a hard time for them to be away from their teachers. Where your 16-year-old, their focus is going to be a lot more on friends and maybe new romantic relationships that they're starting but also their um, achievements in school. They might have anxieties about um, tests or grades, or uh, if they're moving on a trajectory to college or uh, a trade school, they might have worries about the future. So I think um, their worries are different and they're gonna come out in different ways. Uh, 
they might, but they might might both be pouty. Um, they might both withdraw, or they might, uh, depending on their personality, um, kind of let it out in ways that might be difficult in the family. But one of the things about kids that let out feelings, even though they might be difficult, like in the form of a tantrum or being kind of stubborn or difficult at home, is that if you think about that as a way of them sharing their feelings, um, that can be a, a way to begin to talk about what's going on with them. Helpful. There are two questions that came in back to back, and I'm going to actually combine them a little bit. We find ourselves now in this in an unexplored world of technology. And both of these questions actually relate to Zoom in some way. One says, how do you handle the bully or unkind behavior on Zoom? And then the other question, similar I think, is how have you found good resources and establishing norms and appropriate etiquette? And we were in a, involved in a major learning moment on social Zoom and some of the remarks were very bold, out of character, and just really inappropriate. What do we do? Mm, that's, that is a really interesting topic. I will start with um, just kind of guidance. And I, I think, you know, we have been in a space where we've been dealing with uh, the impact on technology and, and the way it can be used for bullying. We know from science, uh, both in our country and in uh, the United Kingdom, that girls are particularly vulnerable um, to feeling depressed and anxious as it relates to um, social media bullying and too much social media. So one of the things that we know is that when um, when teenagers are spending a lot of time flipping through kind of rapid response te um, apps like Instagram and Snapchat and things like that, um, the more often they're on it and the more quickly they're going through, um, the more uh, the, the, the heightened anxiety. So that could be something to talk particularly with girls about how that kind of bombardment of social images is uh, really not healthy for them. So helping them get some monitoring, self-monitoring around their, their use of apps. In terms of direct bullying, like classroom or Zoom or things like that, um, certainly reaching out to the school and the teachers. Um, they might, you know, they have a lot going on. They might not know or recognize all of it, just the same, same kind of scenario that might happen in a classroom. Um, and also um, helping young people use their voice to call it out and to say, and to name it, to say that's hurtful. I don't appreciate that. Um, maybe practicing with them a list of words that they can use but not in isolation. I think it's important that grownups like the parents, but also um, the school personnel need to know that it's happening so that they can shut it down. We're all learning to use technology in different ways. So there's, there's ways that teachers are learning how to, you know, block um, content that, that is unacceptable. Um, I think the last thing I wanted to say, and I was hoping that I would remember the name of it, but I don't, so I, I'm gonna ask if I can send it to Donna and um, have it on the website. But there is uh, there, there are some really good national resources for teaching kids online safety, particularly during this time. And I think uh, everybody taking a little course in online safety um, would be really helpful. So I'll send those resources. I appreciate that and we will post that information. I think we have time for really two quick questions. My teenager sleeps a lot. His mood mm -hmm. seems fine, but I worry that he's disconnected. Is this just his way of coping with the current situation? I think it could be. So if you think about it as kind of um, hibernation, you know, uh, many creatures, including us, have periods of hibernation, um, you know, when it's not safe to, to be outside for various reasons. Um, if 
that sleeping is excessive to the point where they're not um, able to do the schoolwork that, that they've been assigned, that would be something that, that needs to be addressed. Um, and I would use family time as another way to connect. Um, Zoom parties with grandparents, FaceTime, uh, simple old phone calls the way we used to do it, uh, and or neighbors. Um, so it is a time, maybe it's, it's okay to take a break from some of the stuff that's going on at school, but stay connected to other people and finding those new connections or reestablishing new connections with families and neighbors or uh, church members can also, um, you know, be very, very healthy and expand their network of connection. Okay, last question before we give that website again is, how can I be truthful with my children about the pandemic without scaring them? That is a really good question. It is a fine line. Um, I think one, and you'll notice a trend, I always start with development. So thinking about their age and um, kind of what they understand at various ages uh, is, is an important place to start. So not going, not giving them more information than what they're asking for um, is kind of a good rule of thumb. <clears throat> so that would be one way not to overwhelm them or scare them with too much information. Number two, we talked about it earlier, is helping them identify helpers and things that people are doing to not only help with the pandemic, but help them to make the world a better place um, through all kinds of creative methods. Um, and that's just as important to wellness, um, helping to, to lift our hope um, during difficult times is just as important as trying to manage germs. Um, how's that, Donna, is there? That's great. That okay. is great. That is great. Hmm. Kate, thank you so much for all that you shared with us today. I'm sure this information has been very helpful and the way the questions were coming in. I know people are getting a lot out of all that you've had to share. Let me just say everyone that a recording of this webinar can will be found and available in 48 hours, just as the one from last Thursday on general wellness during this period. Um, is already available and um, again invite you to join us on Thursday at 3 when we talk about the impact of isolation and how to stay well. The website for those of you who may not be able to see this slide is alms.org slash coronavirus and again great deal of information there generally but if you want to get to the information related to mental health it's alms.org slash coronavirus slash message dash community slash mental dash health dash conversation. You'll be able to navigate the website once you get there to get that information. And several of you have asked about access to this presentation as well as to the slides. So all of the information that's been discussed today will be up in 48 hours. And again, much of what you may be looking for in terms of many of the resources is already available to you. I wanna thank all of you, most especially UK, but all of you for joining us today and being a part of this webinar. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.